Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome. You're tuned in to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. And on today's episode, I have Matt Abrahams. We're going to talk about communication. We're going to talk about martial arts. And uh, honestly, the majority of what we're going to talk about, I don't even know yet because it hasn't happened because this is a live intro. I like doing these a lot more than the intros later because this way I can't spoil anything. Now, if you're new to the show, I want you to check out whistlekick.com. I want you to see all the things that we do for you, the martial artists of the world, as we connect, educate, and entertain you all throughout the world in our effort to get everybody in the world to train for six months. If you want to go deeper on this or any other episode we've done, it's whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. That's what, where you'll find the links to everything we talk about, the transcript, excuse me, and all of that great stuff. But without further ado, Matt, thanks for joining me here today. I am super excited to be with you and I look forward to our conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Me too. I apologize if we're getting some, uh, some of us would call it the sound of freedom. Uh, the F 35s fly right <laughs> over my house and, and I don't know if you can hear it, but they are, they are loud. They are loud planes. I don't hear it, but uh, I'm glad they're doing what they're doing. Excellent. I, I, well, I think that that is what they do. I think they're just here to remind all of us that they're very loud sometimes. <laughs> but I mean, we, we could. I, uh, I have uh, colleagues like that, so <laughs> I understand. <laughs> and sometimes martial arts is like that, isn't it? Right? Yeah. Sometimes you, yeah, you make sometimes. a big fuss to, to prevent having to actually make a fuss, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Where should we start? We've got a few places that we could start. Uh, do you have a preference? Um, I'm I'm happy to okay. to start anywhere. We can we can talk about um, you know in my life how how what I do professionally in terms of coaching communication links to martial arts, or we yeah. can talk about my yeah, martial we, arts journey and where I how, how and I got let's into start it. with the communications part because I think that's going to give us context for who you are, and then we'll probably go back and fill in with martial arts. And, and how that Great. happened. So communication, obviously, I, I, I have this saying in business because I've been a business person my entire adult life. And I've, I've told people with, with rare exception, all problems come down to communication problems. Once in a while, you get I, someone who's a complete jerk. I don't usually use that word, but you know, here on the show, I'm going to use a, a more mild word like jerk. But almost every problem I've ever run into has been a communication problem where I, you know, I said it one way, they heard it a different way or vice versa. And once I started to understand that, it really changed the way I did everything. I 100% agree. Communication is at the root of many of our challenges. It's also at the root of many of our biggest successes. Mm -hmm. uh, for the work I do, I teach at Stanford's Graduate School of Business. I do consulting. I, I often say that communication is operationalized leadership. It's mm -hmm. critical for the way that we interact with each other, with our superiors, with our subordinates. Um, and it, it's just crucial. And yet many people don't take time to reflect on their communication or to actually work on it. We just assume this is the way it's done. That's the way we've always done it. And yet by spending time, really good things can happen. Hmm. Communication is a skill set, like anything else, like, like punching or kicking. Even if you're not naturally good at it, you can improve at it. And if you understand the value in it, it is definitely Absolutely. worth the investment. It, it, so many parallels with the martial arts. Uh, it takes a lot of practice. You know, mm -hmm. I think the best martial artists are those who listen well and the best who uh, communicate are those who listen well. Listening looks a little differently when you're out on the mat than when you're you know, in a conference room, but the skills are the same. Uh, understanding uh, your needs of your opponent in the moment, uh, mm -hmm. very similar to understanding the needs of your audience when running meetings and presenting. So lots of corollaries there, but it, it is a skill. It's a skill you have to work on. And just like the martial arts, it's a skill that we can continue to hone and develop there is no end point. There's always some new lesson to learn. Mm. One of the things we talk about in the, the, the MATIC program that we operate, martial arts teacher training and certification, we talk about how important it is for the person in the front of the room or running the drill or, or whatever to convey information succinctly. And, and anybody out there, right? a lot of people have been through that, that program and they know, um, actually, do I want to give this away? I'm not going to give it away because we'll have people that will do it later and I don't want to ruin it for them. But we have people 
participate in something and instruct a very common uh, uh, physical event in people's lives. And we tell the, tell one person's the instructor and one person is the, the student. And we tell the student, you can only do exactly what the instructor tells you to do. And it just leads to complete chaos and it's hysterical <laughs> because people take communication for granted. They assume mm -hmm. that what's in their head, the picture they've painted in their head is what is visualized when they give a few words to someone, even if they don't have the context. And of course the, the goal there is to get instructors to recognize that a first day white belt doesn't know what you mean and how important that is. So how, you know, go ahead, go ahead. I, no, I, I, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and I, there are, there are similar ac activities that, that I do in my class and have seen others who teach uh, the same thing to make, to make the same point, to make exactly the same point, clarity, concision. We all suffer from the curse of knowledge when it comes to our mm. communication. And in many cases, the curse of passion, we know too much and we care too much about it. And the only antidote to the curse of knowledge and curse of passion is empathy and curiosity. You have to be curious about the other person's perspective and empathetic enough to try to address the world from their point of view. And that's mm -hmm. when you become a better teacher, a better martial artist, a better person, when you are curious and empathetic. And communication mm -hmm. is the tool that helps us do that. The, the curiosity part makes a lot of sense. And I'm, I'm sure people are with you on that. But the empathy part might not be as obvious. Can you speak more to that? So part of what we have to do is get out of our own heads and we have to think about <laughs> the other person's perspective and yeah. their, their, how they approach things and why they might do something like that. Um, you know, uh, one of the big tenets that in I, what I teach and when I, when I practice martial arts is, you know, the, the idea is, is not to actually have combat. It's not to actually have a fight. Sure. And, and in those real world situations where things get hot and tense, one of the things that can diffuse it is listening, understanding the other person's perspective, calming things down. So empathy is very critical. You have to think how is we all come to our our life with different perspectives from different experiences. And we have to think about somebody else in this circumstance. How are they seeing it? That's all what empathy is. Empathy is really um, being able to connect to somebody else's experience. There are people in my field, the field of communication, who argue that the way we learned to communicate simply to demonstrate empathy, to turbocharge our empathy. Oh, wait, oh, what has allowed that. humans to, to grow and prosper is the ability to have empathy and, and to connect, and communication mm -hmm. is a tool that allows that. I guess I can see that. Hard to, yeah. hard to convey safety without empathy, yeah. hard to convey, you know, I'm not trying yes. to take your food. I'm not trying to take your, your child. I'm not trying to throw you off that cliff unless there's some empathetic yeah. element. Okay. All yeah. Right. How did you get into this field? The field of communication? Yeah. Um, cause, cause let, mostly, let's, you know, let's acknowledge yeah. it. Communication yeah. at the, the four year, two and four year degree level is, is almost a cliche. Yeah. Right. It, it doesn't carry a lot of respect, unfortunately, which I think is insane. But you're teaching it at a graduate level, which means I'm assuming you're a Ph.D. And that's a whole different ball of wax. Uh, so actually, I don't have my Ph.D. I have several. Okay. I, have, I have multiple master's degrees. Um, okay. There's a story that there's a whole story. We, we, that. we can add. But I, up, I came yeah. to communicate. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We can stack I, it doesn't enough. quite work that way. But uh, <laughs> yeah. So I, in terms of time served, it does. But sure. in terms of the way the world views it, it's not necessarily the same thing. Um, so I am the the son. I, my brother and I are the, the sons of uh, a teacher and a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And in my household growing up, communication was really at the forefront. Uh, and I've got lots of stories I can share specifically. I'll share one in a moment. But my mother uh, was very good at explaining things, at using language to engage. She taught elementary school, fourth graders, really hard to engage. And then my father uh, was a lawyer 
and everything had to be, it was structured, words really mattered, they have meaning in a very specific way. And so I, I saw these two worlds uh, in terms of how people communicated, and, and, and both were valid, both are valid. Uh, and, and I was able to just soak all of that up. Uh, and, and, you know, and I take that same approach to the martial arts. I've studied multiple arts um, and just really soak up from, from just the different ways of, of doing it, even though mm. punching and kicking, you know, blocking and all of that. Lots of different ways to do it, but still foundational principles. So, so it, it was something that always fascinated me. I'll, I'll tell a quick story. Um, my mother got frustrated at my brother and me because we had lots of stuff, our toys and everything. And she said, we are having a garage sale. Well, I grew up in a community where there were lots of garage sales on weekends. And my mother said, we need to stand out so people will come to ours. And so she instructed my brother and me, and we were about seven, and I was about seven or eight at the time, to misspell the word garage. And if you insert a B in the middle of the word garage, you get garbage. So while everybody in our neighborhood was having garage sales, we were having a garbage sale. And it turns out we sold more stuff than anybody else that weekend. My mother believes it's because our sign was misspelled and, and that drew attention. I think people thought we were stupid and would get better deals. But the bottom line is I learned at a very young age that words matter. Mm -hmm. Communication matters. Um, I had some experiences in high school where I was asked. So with the last name Abrahams, I always went first. I always knew where I sat and the teacher always called on me. Right. And I would get quite nervous speaking uh, in those circumstances. And so when I went to college, uh, I came across a psychology class. It was taught by somebody who's actually quite famous. His name's Phil Zimbardo. He did this, the Stanford prison study, which oh, yeah. many people have heard of. Um, for good or for bad, we learned a lot from it. It wasn't the best way to treat subjects. But what people don't know is part of what motivated him to study prisons is he was very interested in shyness. Because if you think about it in his way of conceptualizing it, shyness is like an internal prison. And, and so I was very interested in anxiety around speaking and how do we actually feel more comfortable and confident. And so I began to study it academically with somebody who had a lot of knowledge. And, and that really just lit my fire went on to grad school, did more research, not just in, in anxiety around speaking, but other things. So that's sort of my origin story, but it really came from just growing up in a family where communication was important and we and it was approached in different ways. And that yeah. really just opened my mind to it. Ooh, what I'm hearing that's really interesting to me is the, the contrast of your parents and the mm. styles of communication that they would have had during their day. And the fact that they, I mean, you didn't say if, if, you would term the marriage successful, but I didn't hear you say it wasn't. So I'm oh, going no. to guess that it was. And in my mind, that meant that they were extremely skilled in communication in that they could adjust the style of communication because so many people, if they're a lawyer in their day job, they go to class and they're a lawyer and they go home to their family and they're a lawyer and they talk to their friends and they're a lawyer. And that doesn't work in this, you could say the same thing about an elementary school teacher, mm -hmm. that unless you can adjust the style of communication for your audience and for the context, you don't reach people as well. And so you got that. And to me, that sounds like it's even more valuable. Uh, absolutely. Uh, it, it, so my parents' marriage uh, was very strong. Uh, they 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 were married over sixty plus years. My mm -hmm. father recently passed. I'm so sorry. Um, so so sixty it, years thank is you. incredible. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I mean, just just long, long good marriage, uh, and so yes, and and so part of what they demonstrated for me and taught me, and something I try to do in the work I do is you have to adjust and adapt. There is no one right way. There are lots of ways. Uh, and it's really about adjusting and adapting. And, and again, obviously a corollary to the martial arts there too. But uh, yeah, so uh, being able to appreciate others' perspectives, being able to, to switch gears and, mm -hmm. and in the academic world, we call it code switching. How do I have to speak in one circumstance versus the other? Uh, I saw that play out in my daily life. All right, so let's, let's, let's rewind you know, wherever martial arts starts to enter your origin story and, and give us some about that. So uh, when I was in junior high school, about 13, um, I was I was a very nervous. I was anxious about the transition into into junior high. Uh, I went to a school that was 
very safe, but but there was some intimidation, especially among the boys. And my my mother saw this in particular. She was very sensitive as somebody who worked in schools. And and I had a cousin, uh, my my cousin who's about ten years my senior, was a martial artist. And mm-hmm. and I had seen him train. I'd I'd been to some of his formal tests in his style. They did tests in front of people, and you could watch. It was a Japanese style. Uh, and I was super impressed. I always looked up to this cousin. He he taught me many things, still does. Uh, and I mean, one lesson he taught me, we, uh, he, he was babysitting uh, my brother and me, and he took us to McDonald's mm-hmm. for food and he ordered two hamburgers and it just blew my mind. It's like, you can get two. What do you mean? I, I always got hamburger fries drink. I didn't know you could get two hamburgers. So it was one of the, so he's opened my eyes to many things dating back to, to yeah. my childhood, uh, eating habits. But, uh, I was always enamored with what I saw him do. I always looked up to him. Uh, he he had some weapons training in his his martial arts, and you can imagine to a young kid seeing somebody using weapons was really impressive. And uh, sure. so my mother asked him to help. To said, "Hey, Matt could use a little confidence building. Uh, can you come help us check out some stuff?" And wh- where I grew up, and when I grew up, and you know, this is the early '80s. There weren't a lot of martial arts studios around. Uh, there were mm-hmm. just a few, and my cousin helped check things out. And uh, he had a really strong feeling towards the the studio that I ended up studying with and still am with today, 40 years later, um, and with some breaks in between. But uh, that's that was the origin. It was just through my cousin and, and my mother's perception that I needed just a little self-confidence mm-hmm. boost through through self-defense. OK. And, and did you get that? Did Absolutely. You have that confidence? OK. Absolutely. How quickly? Absolutely. Yeah. Did, did, did that uh, resonate You know, quickly? it came... It came within the first couple of years. Um, you know, f- 13, 14 is an awkward stage for most people. So it, as going through that, it gave me a level of confidence uh, mm. very, very early on. Um, about four years, four or five years into my training, I started teaching. Uh, even though I hadn't received my first black belt yet in, in the studio, I, I initially trained in um, senior senior students would teach younger students. Uh, and so that's where I got the teaching bug. You know, people, I've been teaching for decades, not just martial arts, but in general teaching. And people say, well, you know, when did you start teaching? My first teaching uh, took place in the dojo and I was, and I learned a lot. I mean, not only Same. did I teach little, younger kids, but I also taught adults. Um, and, and, and that was really formative for me here as a, as a teenager teaching adults uh, really taught me a lot about myself about mm. how to teach, about how to, to balance power and experience it. So it was a, it was a great experience. Mm. And, you know, one of the things I think, unfortunately, a, a lot of academic teachers te- they miss the part where most of their students have to be there or at least perceive that they have to be there. And so they, they miss a lot of opportunities. Whereas when you're teaching martial arts, nobody's got to be there. There's no state mandate that says you've (laughs) got to be there or, you know, people aren't spending 30, 50, I mean, these days, $80,000 a year for a few classes and they feel, okay, I really need to be here. And there's a grade that moves me on and, and, and everything, right? Martial arts, if we don't make it enjoyable, people don't show up. And so I'm going to guess you picked up some of that as well. Yeah. You know, uh, I wouldn't, when I do my teaching and when I go through my experience, I, I enjoyment, I, I don't know that I focus on enjoyment, to be quite honest. I, I focus on fulfillment. I focus on feeling a sense of purpose and growth. Sure. And when I teach the martial arts and when I teach communication and the other things I do, that's really where I focus. And and you've actually helped me realize that I, I've learned that from the the teaching I did in the martial arts. It's I, I want people to to appreciate the experience, but I don't need them to have fun. Um, I, I need them to to feel a sense of purpose and growth and understanding. And from that, I think you get a sense of satisfaction. But when I teach the martial arts, and I'm happy to, to learn from others who do it, um, I, I, I'm, not, the, I'm not striving to make it a fun experience. Um, it's great if it is, but it's really about purpose fulfillment in, in that way i'm curious to get your thoughts do you do you, do you well, sense do, can you appreciate what i'm saying absolutely. i guess is my question i, I suspect that yeah. we're that i'm i'm using the word the word fun in a very broad yeah. heavy-handed way yeah. right yeah. what what i'm hearing from you is a more nuanced version yeah. of fun right there has to be sorry some... if i took it too seriously i took it too literally <laughs> that, sorry and, and that's okay i mean 
communication, right? It's a perfect illustration that, yeah. that words matter. That yeah. I find that there are plenty of martial arts schools out there that will, the instructors will hide behind their, their poor instruct, instructor abilities, uh, their poor communication yeah. and say, you know, I don't care if they enjoy it. I don't care if they have fun. I don't care if they want to be here. If you want to learn, and, and this is where they will often throw in something, the real thing or the right way, this is how it has to be done. When, you know, when you look at whether it's educational theory or, you know, the way children learn, however you, you wrap your head around it, unless there's some broad version fun yes. threaded through, it becomes really difficult to adequately convey. Absolutely. And I, and I do think when you're teaching young kids, fun is really important uh, in that. Um, you, you do build in games and activities. But, but yes, there, there are um, teaching is an art. Teaching is an art, I believe. They, and I, I make a distinction between teachers who, who just go through material and educators who are truly passionate about learning and helping others learn. And, and true martial arts educators are, are very special. Mm -hmm. um, just like two educators in an academic setting are very special and, and it is a skill and it's a skill that you can learn and you can develop. Um, and, and I do think it's important. I, I think we lose a lot of people who would benefit from the martial arts because of poor instruction. There are a lot of people out there who unfortunately, and I think we're the only industry that really does this, that say, okay, you've done this for a while you know how to do it yourself. Now I'm going to turn you loose to show other people how to do it in a professional context, right? In, in, in most martial arts organizations, and, and, and this is changing, and it actually seems to be changing pretty rapidly, which, is, which excites me. It was not that long ago that your teaching credential, so to speak, and, and for the folks listening, not watching, I'm using air quotes, was simply your rank and you know, it might be first degree black belt, second degree black belt, whatever the equivalent might be, if, if it's a, a system that ranks differently. And that was it. And people would go off and they would figure thing out, things out the hard way. And I was absolutely in that group. You know, and I was a better teacher than most with the level of experience that I had because I had some instructors who taught me how to instruct a little bit. But most people, they get out there and they're they're struggling. And imagine what uh, what an elementary school or a university would look like if we did the same thing. Hey, you're really good at physics. You're going to teach physics. Wait, what? <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's really important to scaffold the teaching of, of skills uh, like the martial arts uh, just to really help people. Um, just to... You know, I I believe that the the and you've heard this before that we learn more through teaching than we do through anything oh, else. Sure. So I think there's a role for teaching. And many, you know, in all the martial arts I've studied, there, there's been times where you partner up with people and we teach each other. And I think that's a really formative step of that. But to to run a class where you are, you know, training people in the foundational principles, having having some of those built in. Um, communication uh, and, and teaching skills really makes a big difference. Yeah. The, the more time I spend teaching, the more I have stepped away from the term teacher. And, and mm -hmm. for a long time, I was using the word more leader. I'm in the front of the room. And, mm -hmm. you know, I come from a Japanese tradition and I like the term sensei because, you know, one who's gone before, I, I, I kind of dig that. But now I find myself even if I'm not using the word, I see myself more as a facilitator. I am facilitating the mm -hmm. education of my students. And you're, you, you nodded and, and half smiled there. So I, I'm going to get, no, I think that's right. On. I mean, it, it, there's, there's, there's a saying, you know, it's, are you the sage on the sage or the sage on the stage or the guide on the side? Mm -hmm. And I think the best martial arts instructors are the guides on the side. They're the, they're the people who are facilitating not just dictating what is said. And, and so I think your approach aligns nicely with my approach. And that's why you saw the, the, the smirk. So how did you go from junior high, 13, mm -hmm. learning, starting to teach martial arts to now, right? There, there's obviously there's a college happens in there somewhere. Is that, is that a, a, a stepping stone yeah. to chat about? Yeah. Well, so, you know, it, it, it took me a while to get my first degree black belt. 
Um, there were some, you know, pauses mm -hmm. in there with going away to school, although I actually went to school very close to where I grew up. So I was able to continue to teach and to, and to train. Um, and just, you know, like anything and like any sport or activity you do, you, you find others who do it. So in college, I found others who were martial artists mm -hmm. in the university I went to there, there were lots of a, a different martial arts. And so I, I dabbled a little bit. Um, I, I, and I had the high school friends who didn't know I was the martial artist among us. The rest were into other sports. Um, and I had one friend once who, who, you know, he said, you take karate, I do track. <laughs> implying he's just going to run away if there was any confrontation. I thought that was funny. Um, and, and yet when we came back for the first summer from college, several of my friends had started taking martial arts. And oh, so I got interested in others and over some, it started um, different studying different arts through my friends because yeah. they, they had experience. Um, but it was when I went to grad school where, where I really got interested uh, in studying uh, some of the Chinese arts um, in particular. In, in undergrad, my minor was in East Asian philosophy, uh, obviously driven by my interest in the, in the martial arts and, and learn, reading, reading some of the, the foundational texts of some of the martial arts, uh, the I Ching and, and others, mm -hmm. um, what really got me interested. So I started studying some of the internal Chinese arts in grad school, which was really interesting. And it, it, I just keep on, I just keep fi finding, found, uh, I just kept finding new and more interesting nuanced ways. And as I have progressed over the years, the training has become less martial and more spiritual. And I find that really helpful. I, I you know, I tell people the mar martial arts is my therapy. Uh, issues I have in life tend to play out in the, in the dojo where I, mm. I actually can learn from them. And then similarly, issues I have in the studio, uh, I, I can learn from in life when I come out. So for me, it's a, it's a very um, personal journey. And that's helped motivate me as, as I've, I've matured. Mm. Okay. Now you, you, you pointed out in grad school, you gained an interest in Chinese martial arts. So up to that mm. point, had it all been Japanese stuff you trained? So my, my highest rank and the rank I still study and teach today is American Kempo. Oh. And, and people have strong opinions about that. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm happy to, to take part in it, but for me, it's been a very helpful uh, study and style, and I appreciate its balance and practicality. It has a science to it that I mm -hmm. gravitate towards that I, that I appreciate. Um, but I've studied other Japanese styles. So I, as a younger kid, the, the very first martial art I ever studied was judo, uh, in our community education classes during summers, my mom signed me up for a judo class. So that was the first expo exposure I had. And then there was a break before I mm -hmm. studied through, uh, the story I told you about with my cousin. Uh, but my a good friend of mine who returned from from college had started uh, jujitsu, uh, kodenkan jujitsu. So again, yeah. traditional Japanese jujitsu, and I and I studied that for a while as well. Um, and and then it was really in grad school that I got interested in Xing Yi and Bagua, yeah. uh, just because they're they're so different um, and yet so complementary, and studied that for a while as well. And then when I left grad school and started working. My, my martial arts, I still did it, but just took a little bit of a back seat. And then I found uh, somebody who was local in the community who, who was able to teach uh, Xingyi more than Bagua to me. And so I studied, I kept that while I was doing the Kempo. So I've always dabbled. And, and now, um, you know, Xingyi, Bagua, Tai Chi, the, the triumvirate, I, I am now studying some Tai Chi and have been and am finding great enjoyment. And, and all along the way, I've been doing Qigong and other things. So so I, I, I have a, a very broad approach to my studying of martial arts. You are, you are. This is where a lot of people would use the word eclectic, and I don't want to use that because it suggests <laughs> that they are disconnected. But what I'm hearing no, is that I you're mean, connecting them. And, and, and that yeah. does not surprise me as someone who prioritizes communication, right? Because communication, language, to me, martial arts is phys physical expression of language to a certain degree mm. and anything you're doing in a non, yeah. if, if we're not actually engaged in combat, we're having a conversation with our hands and feet. And I love that because when I teach it and when I have found being, uh, having ha good teachers who've taught me, they teach it like a language, right? Yeah. They, there's, there's, they're the, the components of the language, the words, the structure, 
Uh, and then there's the the free flowing nature of of it, you know, when, when at least in the style, the 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 Japanese are more or more oriented styles with kata, with kumite, uh, with with sometimes self defense techniques. Each of those teaches a different skill that has a corollary in communication. Um, and so it's I find that uh, refreshing that you see it the same way. It is a language, you know. Yeah. Um, it, it, it when you are in training and in sparring or in conflict with somebody you are communicating and you do so uh, with your body with your with uh, as well as the words you use yeah and one of the things i find really interesting is that if if someone spends i don't know what the minimum is but let's say a few years training in a particular art mm -hmm. especially if they do so at a young age almost every other art that they train in, you'll be able to see. If you know that that first art, yeah. you can see its influence. You can see the accent in other <laughs> things. You know, I grew up doing karate. And yeah. fortunately, my Taekwondo instructor also started in karate. So he didn't yeah. mind that my Taekwondo yeah. forms looked like karate forms. And I've got my, my assistant instructor now. I met her through Taekwondo. Yeah. And so she's doing karate. Yeah. With a Taekwondo Through accent. Through that lens. Yeah. So you had a, yeah, I'm glad you had a positive experience. I have to say that, that, um, the, the, uh, Shingi instructors I've had have, have definitely had some qualms with the, the karate approach that I brought to things. And so, but, but it, it, it led to some interesting conversations. And for me, uh, an appreciation of different ways of accomplishing the same goal. And, and so that I think is the richness of the martial arts and, and studying different arts. I know there are people who are very dedicated to their art and I respect that completely, mm -hmm. but I think there is value in dabbling and trying other arts because those different approaches can teach you a lot. And actually I am a better, I am better at my Kempo because I have studied the other arts. Absolutely. Yes. Hands down. Um, and, and even though that the studying of my Kempo probably made me a worse student in those other arts, but, uh, it absolutely has been additive. But I would suggest that it may, might've made you a worse student only because the instructor didn't yeah. know how to leverage that understanding of movement, right? I, That's, I, because yeah. I have cross trained in a variety of things, if I have a student come in and actually about half of my karate school is people with experience in Korean martial arts, whether that's, mm -hmm. you know, Tong Soo Do or, or various flavors of Taekwondo. And I've got enough experience with those styles that I can say, okay, uh, you think of doing it like this, but then that, right? right. And that resonates for them because otherwise their body is going to default to the thing that I don't quite want them to do. And so I'm not going to get mad at them for not having a clean slate. Right. And I love, I mean, that's a great teaching technique, right? It's, it's teaching through analogy, teaching through comparison. And, and I think that's really, it's important. And because of your experience in those other arts, you have that expanded vocabulary mm -hmm. that can help people make those connections. And I think that's, that's great. That's great. You got to meet people where they're at. Mm -hmm. Right. 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 So you go on school, grad school, mm -hmm. it w was it communications the whole time? Is that, was that psychology undergrad uh, okay. communication grad school? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And were you always planning to be an academic or was there expectation? Uh, no. So I, so I left, uh, I left uh, academia to pay off student loans and other things. I worked in industry for about 10 years. Um, and then when my wife and I started our family, uh, I didn't want to be doing all the traveling and all the crazy hours I was working. And, and I went back to my passion, which was teaching. I actually taught high school for two years. I graduated to teach community college for a number of years. And, and now I'm at Stanford's business school where I teach graduate students. So uh, I've, I keep graduating. Um, I don't know what's next, but, uh, but I enjoy what I do. And I have uh, uh, my students are amazing and, and it allows me to have the lifestyle that I mm. appreciate. So uh, so yes, communication has been at the core of everything I've done and it's evolved over time. All right. You, you even acknowledged this earlier that when we teach, we become better. And, and most of mm -hmm. us, you know, even if we don't have our own school or we, we haven't been mm -hmm. training a long time, we've had enough of, of the kind of sharing and having to explain something to someone in class that, you know, it, 
we can at least wrap our heads around saying, yeah, my, my martial arts instruction, no matter how light that is, has helped me become a better martial artist. But I bet most of us don't have the experience of being in an academic environment where, you know, we're teaching us, you're teaching a subject that, yeah, there, there, there can be a physical element to it, but it is not on its surface something that one can see, right? I can, mm -hmm. wa you know, I can watch my students move and get pretty close to whether or not they're doing it correctly, so to speak, short period of time and even at a distance. Your subject matter doesn't quite work that way. So how are you becoming better in your field by teaching your students this internal art, so to speak? <laughs> So I think the only way we get better at any teaching is three things. It's repetition, reflection, and feedback. Okay. So you got to practice. You got to do it. You know, nobody becomes a good teacher just by thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Just like nobody becomes a good martial artist just by thinking about it. It's important to think about it, but that's not how you become expert. There, are, there are some folks out there. They're not in our yeah, audience, it, but there are some folks out there that might be very upset to hear that. Well, no, I mean, it, it's an important part, but it is not all. So we have to, you have to actually do it, repetition. Then you have to reflect. I mean, there's that definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. If you don't reflect, you don't get better. Mm -hmm. So in my teaching, at the end of every class, at the end of every week, I reflect. I take a few minutes, what worked, what didn't work. And then I set goals for myself. Same thing with my martial arts, what worked and what didn't work. I mean, you, your experience and everybody listening, their experience is probably very similar. And the martial arts, the, there'll be long periods periods of plateau and then there'll be some kind of breakthrough where things change and then another plateau in terms of the learning and the skills, especially when you get into some of the internal things we're doing to, to help ourselves get more powerful or more fluent, etc. And the same thing is true in, in teaching. So you have to reflect and it's the, that reflection that helps you move out of those plateaus into, into ascending to new levels. And then finally, you have to get feedback. You know, uh, the, one of the, <laughs> I'll never forget when I got my first black belt. Uh, I felt like I accomplished. This is it. I've done it. I've I've climbed that mountain. And my my instructor, who I'd been with for, for many, many years, came to me and said, congratulations, you did very well. Now let's get started. Mm -hmm. And that blew my mind. It's like, what do you mean we're getting started? But it's at that moment that I learned that that it's just the beginning. Right. And yeah. with every subsequent rank, it's just the beginning. And the same thing is true in teaching and learning other uh, teaching and learning other skills. Mm -hmm. Each you have to get feedback from others so that you can learn, so that you can develop and, uh, and, and have some good guidance uh, along the way. So repetition, reflection, and feedback is how I try to work on my teaching and how I try to work on my martial arts. Okay. And are there things that you think you do differently from your colleagues because of your experience in martial arts? Oh, are absolutely. Okay, yeah, speak to that. No, that absolutely. So in the martial arts, we learn to play with space. And I don't, you know, sometimes it's physical space, but also emotional space. And, and I, will, I will do that in a way that, that I don't, you know, not everybody does in terms of teaching. So, uh, you know, there's this notion, especially in the Chinese arts, of taking someone's space, right? And, and there are times as a teacher where I will take space in the room and I'll take other people's space uh, when it's time to teach, when it's time to finish an activity. And there are other times where I'll give space, where I'll, I'll, I'll allow other things to happen. So this notion of, of using and managing space. And again, I don't just mean physical space, although that's part of it. It's just control, if you will, giving control, taking control. And I think that's important. Um, I, I've also learned uh, to listen more, to be present, to pause, to pay attention to what's being, what's, what's being said, but also what's not being said. Um, and those are all lessons that the martial arts uh, have taught me. And, and, you know, my students will be the judge if, if, it, if it's a different approach that they learn from differently than others. But I, I absolutely feel that I do things that others might not do. Mm. It's really interesting. We, we could take the last probably 60 seconds and with just yeah. a few word changes, yeah. that description could also be my, my interview style. Right? I leave yeah. a lot of space and, and I've done yeah. this on the show and, and, you know, we always have new folks. I'll, I'll do this right now. You know, you might finish some saying something and expect that I'm going to chime right in, but. Yeah. Silence. Right? And there's, and there's the moment, right? I, I felt it a split second before you filled it. And yeah. once I realized that 
if the pause is too long, we'll cut it in post. It gave me yeah. so much freedom. And yeah. if, if you go back, if someone really wanted to see the, the, I don't know why anyone would want to see this, but if someone was really interested and wanted to see the progression of, of Jeremy Lesniak as interviewer on martial arts radio, you huh. could go probably every 75 to hundred episodes and you would see that I become more comfortable with that space mm -hmm. and leaving the space. And once I became conscious of this, I started to notice that space was the differentiator in almost everything. And, and mm -hmm. originally I had discovered that reading something about classical music, that if what we truly resonated with as human beings in music was perfection, we would only want to hear robots play music. <laughs> But no one's going right. to Carnegie Hall to hear a robot because a great musician plays the space between the notes. Mm -hmm. And if you mm -hmm. watch a, in a, a top-notch martial arts form, a kata, you know, I would call yeah. them katas, practitioner, yes. they will, they're, they're doing the same movements, but it's the space between the movements. And a, a good orator Mm -hmm. It's the space between the words, right? And so the older I get, the more I, I'm, I'm starting to look at space as mm -hmm. the differentiator in everything. Whether taking, I think that's giving... really. Go ahead. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I took space from you, and I didn't mean to. <laughs> but I think it's really insightful. I really do. I think, I think space pausing, um, appreciating. You know, in our communication, we don't do that. We 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 feel a pause as a sign of weakness. If somebody asks a question, I have to respond right away. Uh, if if I need to collect my thoughts, I have to be filling it with ums and uhs and not having that silence or pause. Pausing is very powerful. Those who are seen as powerful take pauses, take longer pauses, use space more. Uh, so you're you're absolutely right. And pausing, of course, you know that can be. A verbal pause doesn't have to be mm -hmm. a, a, a full pause in communication. So much communication. I mean, maybe, maybe you're the best person to ask on the percentage. People kick around these numbers of what percentage of communication is nonverbal, but it, at the very least, it's a significant amount. And so I might pause and look or gesticulate or, or you know, express something with my eyes. Doesn't mean I'm not communicating. That's right. Uh, uh, communication. Uh, I'm not a big fan of percentages. It is safe to say that it, the nonverbal presence and how you use space and how you use your body and voice play a critical role in being effective in your communication. In some circumstances, it plays a really large role and others a less, less mm -hmm. of a significant role, but it's critical to focus on. And the martial arts train that presence. There is a pre you can tell somebody who's studied the martial arts and somebody who hasn't. Not only do they tend to be very humble, but they tend to be very present, and you can feel that, and that's that's impressive. So, of course, you've got this skill set with communication and, and instructing communication, and I'm, I'm, it's fairly obvious how if you are instructing people in martial arts, how that's going to play a role. But what about as a student? So when I'm a student, yeah, yeah. How how, how, how does has... that change things for for you? Because we do live, we 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 exist in this environment where sometimes we're expected to, to be blunt, shut up, and just watch and try. Mm -hmm. You know, and and I I would imagine that trying to balance all of those things, given that this is part of what you spend so much of your day doing, might become challenging. It can be. It can be. I, uh, I, I have uh, a lot of forward motion in my, in my life. I, I am moving forward. I am moving fast. And, and I am constantly learning. Uh, perhaps the most frequent lesson across all the martial arts I, I've trained in and with my, my instructor who I've been with forever uh, is to be present. Mm -hmm. And, and it's very, I, am, I am wired to, to be ahead of the game. And so that's hard for me, and it, it is hard. But I have learned over all these years, sometimes very painfully in the dojo, that being present-oriented, being open, uh, being open literally mm -hmm. to new ideas, uh, it, it can be very helpful. And so it, it can be challenging for me dispositionally. 
Uh, but being somebody who is paid to communicate, paid to share ideas, um, it, it can also be hard just to be quiet. Mm -hmm. But I've also learned uh, that there are many ways to do things. My way isn't always the right way. And that, that by being quiet and observing, and as a parent, uh, also realizing that, that some of the best lessons are learned through people doing and making their own mistakes rather than telling. So a whole lot of, of avenues are conspiring to get me to slow down to be present, and to listen more than I speak. What's the future bringing for you? You, know, you yeah, said well, thank forward you for momentum. Asking. So what, what, yeah, what no, thank you for asking. So I'll, I'll share in my, my personal professional life, and then I'll share in my martial arts Please. life. So um, I, I am very committed to communication, to helping others communicate better. Uh, I released a book uh, in September. Uh, so it's coming up on its year anniversary, and I'm still very actively trying to use that book to help people. It's a book all about how to speak in the moment spontaneously. If you ever have any training in communication, it's usually around planned presenting, like create the presentation or here's the agenda for the meeting. But most of our communication is like what you and I are doing, which is mm -hmm. in the moment, spontaneous. Oh, you didn't script all this out? I, uh, you know, I don't have it. And it certainly doesn't seem uh, like you have one either. So it's great. And that's where life happens, Never. right? That's life happens in that spontaneity. Um, and then uh, I also have a podcast I host, so I can appreciate and empathize with the work you do. And, and you, you put on a great podcast. Uh, it's called Think Fast, Talk Smart, which is all about communication skills. So unlike yours, mine are very short. They're about 20 minute episodes. So I'm really committing and dedicating a lot of my time to, to that because it's another vehicle to help people learn. Yeah. From my martial arts perspective, it's, it's same old, same old. It's, it's continue to do the work, continue to learn. I'm getting ready to test for my sixth degree in, in one style, um, training, training in Tai Chi, as I said, trying to find more time to do Qigong. Uh, mm -hmm. I do it every day, but I'd like to do more. Um, so, so it's really prioritizing uh, that, and, and, and that's where my, my future direction is headed. Yes. Uh, what's the name of that book? Uh, my book is called, yeah, I'm very, I'm, <laughs> I'm, uh, I, I stay on brand. It's called Think Faster, Talk Smarter. The, the podcast <laughs> is Think Fast, Talk Smart. And the book is Think Faster, Talk Smarter. Um, there will be no Think Fastest, Talk Smartest. Uh, so we, 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 we run the course on it. You, you could, I don't know, you could extend the brand with, with ish, think fast ish. You could go the opposite direction. Talk smart. -ish. Yeah, you're right. You're right. See, you're right. You're right. I'll have, you're now part of the PR team. Hey. Great, <laughs> great. I, I uh, and where where would people pick that up? Is it you, you can you can buy the book anywhere you get books, okay. uh, in person or, or online. And the podcast okay. is everywhere. Anywhere anybody can find you, including YouTube, you can also find Think Fast Talk Smart. So, okay. excellent. Um, I mean, since we're going through this stuff, social media or websites that we should yeah. make sure people. So uh, mattabrahams.com, great place to go to, to get resources. Uh, I, I have a whole bunch of free resources around communication skills. Many of them translate into to martial arts skills, teaching skills. Um, that's a great place to go. I'm a big user of LinkedIn. Uh, mm -hmm. Anybody who wants to connect through LinkedIn, happy to do that. Great. Awesome. Um, well, it's few more minutes. I, I don't feel sure. like we should wrap yet. Yeah, okay. Like we we, no we opened some good stuff. I so can I ask you a question or By two? By all means. So, so, so I, you know, I'm going to, now I'm going to put on my podcast host. Um, <laughs> I am, I am fascinated by two things. One, your motivation to bring martial arts to a broad community. You have thousands of listeners. Uh, curious to know where that came from. And then how have you found it talking to people who are experts in lots of different martial arts fields? Have you found some threads or commonalities that, that not, not in the actual kicking and punching, but in demeanor, in approach? So, so I guess what, what motivates you to do the work you do, which I think is fantastic, um, because what you do is you help people realize the martial arts isn't what we see on television and what we see in the movies. It's, it, it, it's a true art. And then uh, I'm just curious what you've learned across all of these hundreds of people you've interviewed. Yeah. So, so the first, the first question is easier to answer and, and it's, yeah. it's just, it's working backwards from the goal. What's the goal? The goal is that I get everybody in the world to train for six months. Why? Mm -hmm. Because I think it would make their lives better. I th and I think by consequence, it would make the world better. And I just want to yes. make the world better. I'm just, you know, I, I've, I've said this before, I'm just trying to change the world. And, and I, I use the word just in that statement, because I think that that is all of our responsibility. We should just be yes. trying to change the world. 
notice I, I don't say by how much, right? Just, yeah. just trying to change the world. And so, okay, got to get everybody to train. How do I get everybody to train? Uh, well, a couple things have to happen. One, martial artists have to stick around. And mm -hmm. so the majority of what we do is providing resources, entertainment, et cetera. It's the connect, educate, entertain for people who mm -hmm. are already in or were in and want to get back in mm -hmm. to traditional martial arts. And we do a little bit and and as we've grown we are finding more and more opportunities to get people who are not currently training to get them into training right and so it's i just want the world to be better right and and i think that when i when i look at all the different ways i could make a substantial impact that will last long beyond my death it is through martial arts you know, I, I don't, I don't care about personal recognition. I care about the martial arts recognition. I care about the, that more people, I want more people to train tomorrow than train today. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the why there. What a lovely goal. What a lovely, it's a gift to give. And, and uh, what we know from research in motivation and persuasion is having a clear target, like six months. Uh, is is really powerful. It's not just start the martial arts because that can feel intimidating, and, and but six months of it. And you're right; a lot of people get addicted and and find extra value in it. So that's great. Thank you for and, sharing that. Of course, of course. And and the reason it's six months is that I, I think six months is long enough that even if someone doesn't continue, they will be cognizant of the benefits that they derived. I've mm -hmm. I've had and and maybe you've had this, and I suspect most of the audience has had this. People will come up to you, you know, have a conversation. They find out that you've done that you do martial arts. That maybe you teach martial arts, or you, you you've been training for a while. And quite often, they will say something like, "I want my kid to do karate, taekwondo, whatever, mm -hmm. because I did that when I was a kid for six months, right. a year, two years, and I know it helped me." I've never heard anyone say that about basketball or soccer or going to mm -hmm. archery camp mm -hmm. or any of these other mm -hmm. things. Now, are there other things that benefit children? Of course, but I don't believe there's anything that is more universally perceived as being beneficial as traditional martial arts training. So I 100% agree. And, and the, and the corollary uh, and the, and the add on skills of focus, respect, attention right. Right. Uh, are, are, are fantastic. So 100% yes. agree. And as to what folks have in common, you know, we, there's a little bit of selection bias with who comes on the show because we don't, we don't placate ego, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah. And there is a fair amount of ego in the martial arts. And there is a decent amount of ego. And if, uh, again, if, if you go back, if you do, you know, if somebody wants to do a research paper on, on, you know, the arc of, of Jeremy as interviewer, you'll see for the first few hundred episodes, I was absolutely obsessed with the subject of ego in the martial arts mm. and why did it exist? Why was it so prevalent? Why were there so many people around me with phenomenal martial arts skill that were jerks? What happened? And, and I was able to kind of, kind of solve that and figure out why that, that was. And, and, and to be blunt, it's because instructors uh, didn't enforce the character requirements mm -hmm. for rank progression. That's really what it boils down to there. But in terms of what people have in common, when, when we look at the folks who come on, on the show, mm -hmm. it's that they took martial arts out into the world. Whether they right. took it out to run a school, but even if they, they have a school, they're, they're taking it out elsewhere, right? If you, if you look at the episodes that we have, I don't care whether it's it's an actor or an author or an academic teacher or a parent. Martial arts changed who they were, gave them an additional tool set, and they're aware of that tool set. And so they they that gave them uh, some sustenance on their why. They keep training mm -hmm. and they're bettering the world through the these avenues that people would never imagine. When I, when I started the show, there was, and, and, I, and I shared this, if you want to be a professional martial artist, that means that you are a fight choreographer or you're a stunt mm -hmm. performer 
or maybe you bridge one of those into acting or you have a school. That, that was it. Those were the four jobs that anybody right. talked about. But my perspective on that has changed so dramatically because it's it's martial arts is kind of like a, a healthy version of MSG, right? It doesn't matter what you <laughs> sprinkle it on; it makes it better. I just made that an, that, that up. I, 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 I was going to say I love, I, I love analogies. I've yeah. never heard that one. It's, so. it's you know, uh, martial arts is healthy MSG, right? Uh, <laughs> I, I also love analogies. Yes, and I, and I think that that's one of the things that we do on this show really well is that we show people your time invested in martial arts doesn't have to be seen as a hobby. One day we'll have the resources that we can, we can conduct these surveys. But when I, when I take a look at pro athletes and when I took, take a look at sea level executives, it seems anecdotally, that a lot of them had, maybe they're not actively training, but they had a lot of martial arts training at some point. And I believe mm. that the numbers will prove out that they show a higher level of participation of a certain you know, time period than the, than the non-professional athletes, than the non-C-suite executives. I think that's true. It's really, you know, I, I do a fair amount of coaching of, of individuals, mm. uh, executives, et cetera. And if not martial arts, at least some very committed, dedicated physical activity. Yeah. There is something about being physical, about having to train that differentiates effective senior leaders and those who aren't. It's discipline. Yeah. Right? Dis I, I, the older I get, the more I think discipline is the secret. And the secret to what? The secret yeah. to everything. Mm -hmm. Right, because we we exist in this world where media, social media, have convinced us that everyone who is successful is successful because of some innate talent that they discovered on day one, and they were the world's best on day three. And that's just not how it is. Everything is the result of tremendous discipline and just not stopping. And so here we are, your episode nine, whatever. I wasn't good at the yeah. beginning. The show's okay now. We kept putting. In I the think reps. the show is very good, and I appreciate you sharing uh, the insights that you've gained from your guests. It's it, it it brings a smile to my face because as a podcast host myself, I mean, I I feel selfish in a way because I get to learn all of this stuff and and I try to share it. But there, there's it, it it's just fantastic. Um, and I think what part of, to go back to your point about discipline. Um, I think discipline is so important. Part of discipline that I think really separates uh, good leaders and, and good martial artists, actually, is the understanding that, that making mistakes, failure, mm -hmm. if you will, is a critical part of growth and that we learn through our mistakes. I, I can't I mean, when you listen to one of my lessons with my, my the instructor I've been with forever, somebody from the outside listening who's not a martial artist would be, what the hell are you guys talking about? He, he'll say things like, you did it wrong correctly, or you you did it right but wrong, right? So so you know there's there's the move was right, but the intentionality, the approach was wrong, and and that there's an appreciation of learning through mistake, learning through trying different ways, and that that's a key part of discipline. And I think those who study any kind of physical activity, be it running, swimming, soccer, basketball, whatever. Anybody who trains in something and has a good coach and a good experience builds that discipline and builds that a, a way of looking at mm. learning. I've become obsessed over the last couple of years and in part because we're running these teacher trainings, but also before that yeah. with how people learn. Yeah. Hyper obsessed because I, I see my job as a martial arts instructor. And, and honestly, this was the premise under which I started my school. I, I, said, I think I can get people moving along two to four times faster if I rework how we train and learn martial arts through our modern understanding of, of education. And one of the things I'll, I'll talk about when I give a seminar is we learn by making mistakes, but a lot of times once we get out of youth, it's, it's not celebrated. The effort is not celebrated. And so I'll, I'll give the example. I've never heard anyone yell at a baby and tell them that they were dumb for not being able to stand up or walk or run. The, yes. the, the effort is celebrated. 
And right. so often, and, and, you know, I think I've shared this, I'll share it again, because we always have new folks. If you look around at most martial arts environments, you'll see a, a, a fairly steady attrition rate that has a big bubble at just before or just after black belt, right? That you, mm -hmm. you if you kind of think right. of it in, 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 in groupings, yeah, fewer people earn uh, a yellow belt or whatever, you know, that first belt is than, than are there for white belt. Right. But we've got a big drop. And why? Because as you get close to that black belt rank or whatever the equivalent is, you've got to put in the, the grit. You've got to have the discipline. And so when you get people, and I see this quite often when someone joins at like nine, 10 years old and their, their proprioceptive skills, their ability to see where their body is for, for that child works really well. And so their praise is not around effort. Their praise is around result. And then they start getting close to black belt and now they don't have the discipline and they don't have the, the, the reps in on, if I try, I will get this and they quit. And it makes me really sad. And so yeah. we've taken a lot I of see that, that pattern. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I see that pattern all the time too. And it's a shame because those yeah. are the, if you could take that innate ability, whether it's martial arts or, or, or yeah. you know, academic or, or anything and stack discipline on top of that. Yeah. Right. And, and, and I just think that's amazing. I, we know who those people are. The, the people that are at the top of their fields in whatever it is, right? Uh, what, what What's the thing that people will talk about most if they understand professional basketball and they understand Kobe Bryant? It's his work ethic. Yeah, absolutely. Incredibly talented, but he had a crazy work ethic. And, and you can find that in all industries. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that was fun. I didn't think we were going to go there, but that was cool. <laughs> no, but that's that's the beauty of it. That's yeah. the beauty of it, and that well, and that's that's the about. that's yeah, absolutely, and uh, and that's why I like martial arts. You know, you do the same moves over and over again, but each time is a different experience. Yeah, and every every time you get a class together, doesn't matter what's on the docket for that day; it's a different class. And even if you could find a way to teach the exact same class, the experience the students are going to have are going to be a little different because they're showing up differently. 100%. And Absolutely. I, and I think acknowledging that is, is beautiful. I understand, you know, I, I, I love forms. I love the standardization. I love, I, I love how it looks when you get, you know, three, five, seven martial artists doing the same form and they are dialed and they look the same. And I think that's really cool. But what I think is cooler is if I ask them all a question about what they've just done and they come up with a slightly different answer. That yeah, I think is even absolutely. better. Absolutely. 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 All right. Well, I'm going to throw it to you to end in, in a minute, you know, just what your, your final words. But to the audience, uh, we're going to make sure we get these links in the show notes for Matt's book and, and, and all that stuff. So make sure you, you check that out. Should be if you're listening in on your phone or tablet should be in the show notes right there. But if you don't see it there, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com is where the full show notes are anyway, including the transcript and all that good stuff. And remember, if you, you want to support us in our mission, whistlekick.com is the, the place to head for all the things. So Matt, I, I do appreciate you and, and would invite you. How do we wrap up this uh, uh, varied and, <laughs> and enjoyable conversation today? Well, I always recommend in, in wrapping up any communication, you start with gratitude. So Jeremy, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your insightful questions and, and for, for guiding the conversation. You know, I, I think at the end of the day, the martial arts communication, it's all about connecting. It's all about learning about yourself and it's all about growing. And there's a there's an aspect of, of, of that, that that's self-focused, but it's also other focused. And so anybody who studies the martial arts, one, I applaud you uh, and I encourage you. Uh, for me, it has been a lifelong journey, one that I hope will continue for a long time to come. And uh, I invite others to to step on that that path as well. Um, and and from that, 
uh, take in uh, the lessons uh, and, and learn and grow and, and inspire others as well. And Jeremy, you do a great job of inspiring not just me, but everybody who listens. So thank you. Thank you.